classic screen this episode I'm looking at the 1970 French film Le Cirque Rouge directed by Jean-Pierre Melville now as usual listen you'll probably get much more contextual and film history literary reviews of these classic films elsewhere I like to go into these movies as blind as ignorant and as ill-informed as possible like I do most things and judge the film in a way that I would any other film that I happened to come across on Netflix for instance. Now I previously did watch another one of Melville's films The Samurai in film school at university. Don't remember anything about it and education kind of has a habit of sucking the joy out of the things you would naturally love anyway. I mean, you could take a class on having sex with good looking women and they'd probably find a way to ruin it somehow. So for all intents and purposes, let's take this as my first real exposure to Melville. And I have to say, I am really impressed by this movie and Melville. And I'm probably going to do a binge of all his movies after this film. So The Circle Rouge is a very understated film in many ways. And despite how elaborate many of the set pieces and moments we are presented with are. I mean, we, we have seen these things happen in other movies, in other works, before or since, depending on how you look at things. And they happen in a much more bombastic and excitable fashion. But I think the key to Le Circle Rouge's ability to trill lies in the understated manner. It presents fantastical elements and events and in how Melville captures what happens within his camera lens in both concise and very precise ways. One thing I really love about going further back in the film, which I encourage you all to do by the way. I mean, we now live in a time where cinema has basically shut down. We don't know when anything is coming out, but how lucky are we that we get to explore the back catalog of so many great films that we have been left with. Now, I had wrote good notes for the next thing I was going to say, but my fucking computer froze and deleted the shit out of them as it turns out. And it was some damn good film criticism. <laughs> so this next bit is kind of like, it's going to be a bit like the Jack Black song tribute. So it's kind of like I had some great notes written down, but I can't remember them. So the next part is more like a tribute to some good shit I was about to say. But I'm not going to say, so enjoy. But what I thought was really, really refreshing about going back and seeing a film like Le Circle Rouge and just reaccustoming myself with a master and the art of telling a story within the frame and through the perfection of capturing what is in front of the frame and telling a story through the movement of the camera. It sounds a very obvious thing to say. But I'm used to living in a cinema where you come away from a film thinking the actors, the special effects or even the script are the most impressive thing about the film. But I can't think of many better examples of using a camera to skillfully craft its elements from capturing what is in front of its lens combined with masterful editing in order to generate its thrills and story momentum. This is like proper old school filmmaking and I love it. I'm used to living in a time it feels like not only what is captured in front of the camera doesn't exist in a fictional sense or otherwise, but also most glaring of all, it can even feel like the camera itself doesn't exist. It can feel like the fluidity and conception or indeed what the camera is doing doesn't exist in any reality. And as a viewer, I can often feel like there is nothing to ground me and even the reality of the film or nothing to hold onto or even grasp it. It feels like the more we've been able to create what is in our minds in special effects chambers or green screens, the more we have kind of lost the art of capturing what is in front of the frame. Listen, it of course still exists and there are plenty of filmmakers who do it. And it, it is one of the things I realized that I love about indie films, but I seldom think you're going to get a better example of in-frame storytelling than Le Circle Rouge. So the story of Le Circle Rouge is as follows, and normally I don't like to give spoilers, but it's such an understated <laughs> film. I, I kind of feel like if I don't give spoilers and break down certain things, it will be very hard to talk about this film or indeed sell it to you guys. So 
the film opens with these two characters in the car rushing to reach a train and we don't immediately notice the key point or at least I didn't you kind of see them rushing to get to the train side by side and then the camera takes you inside the carriage and you see Vogel played by Guyane Volante behind another character played by Andre Bouvel then when they eventually get to their quarters Vogel goes to the top bunk and it's it is only then when you realise that he has handcuffs on and is a prisoner and is being escorted by Inspector Maté. Again, really deliberate, observational storytelling through the lens, expertly done. Again, the story of, of a fugitive being escorted is nothing new, but I just thought how they told the sequence and how it was unveiled and how the scenes were blocked in a very inconspicuous way. And following this, we get this wonderful shot when the camera blocks Maté by the window and I guess zooms all the way out to reveal the beginning of the train journey. Brilliantly shot. Equally, a little bit later, there is a scene in which Vogel attempts to escape that I can kind of imagine unfolding in a movie set in 2020 and how they would conceive a scene maybe with the ability to create anything on a blank canvas and create everything from nothing so to speak that a lot of what the scene is trying to do would be lost so for instance my first example of Maté being viewed through the window then the camera pulling back to capture the train moving is a wonderful technical achievement of capturing what is there to be caught with skillful cinematography that is uh, a, a great example but the breakout sequence in the train, as shot in 2020, would probably start with this almost supernatural perspective of the train with a camera whizzing in and out of the train in places that would be impossible for us or the camera to go. We would get a scene in which Vogel dangles from the train in something that technically doesn't really exist to be shot in front of a camera. And as marvellous as it would be on some level, something tangibly thrilling would be lost from the grounding of the scene. In this attempted escape sequence, the magic and tension is found in something, again, much more understated. But as it turns out, by holding back, we gain even more from the scene, I would argue. We get a sequence of Vogel carefully trying to craft the tool in order to unpick the handcuffs in the top bunk while the inspector is in the bunk below. And this sequence is the big moment. It's the big moment of the escape. And it's followed by an instant smash through the window and jump that do doesn't generate anything like the level of suspense that the handcuff sequence does. But we do also get our cake and eat it and a wonderful chase sequence in shoes after this as well. Next, we are introduced to Corey, played by Alan Dellon, who is just getting released from prison and he is told about a job which eventually will form the final act of the film as this slow burner heist movie creeps up on you and Corey is the definition of smooth French cool he's so cool he still manages to pull off this ridiculous moustache watching it in 2020 it looks like something from November week he still looks slick despite what wearing what I would consider a very feminine trench coat for much of, much of the movie and he carries himself with an almost rigor mortis type of stiffness at times combined with a cocksuredness bordering on invincibility but he pulls it off with a definitive level of suave that makes it not irritating and he comes across much more like somebody who is invincible because he is good at what he does rather than he is some kind of Chuck Norris or Steven Seagal kind of figure. And again, when he is getting released from prison, we get this wonderful, simplistic, but very affecting visual storytelling and block building. We see Corey getting released from prison, gathering his belongings. He takes a few things. Then we see pictures of this girl. He looks through them, leaves the pictures there. And later on in a sequence further on, we get to see this girl in the scene. They never interact, but because of what the camera infers in the earlier scene, we understand the whole situation and what the whole disagreement is between Corey and the central or maybe secondary antagonist, depending on how you feel about Inspector Maté. Again, the story elements of what unfolds between the girl, it's far from revolutionary stuff, but much like the breakout scene with Vogel, there is a real artistry in how the scene is delivered and that is where the joy is uh, found many times in this film. 
Our final character in this tale is a former policeman who we are introduced to in this trippy as fuck scene that is way more disturbing probably because again we had to rely on what the camera can capture and we meet Jensen played by Yves Montand who I guess is detoxing from alcohol or just tripping balls because he has drank too much and we get this dream sequence that I think is pretty disturbing where crabs snakes and rats and all sort of things come from the side door of the room and surround him and again no fancy trickery involving special effects and all these elements are so grounded in a physical reality that we feel as suffocated as jensen does in this scene and it's really trippy now i won't spoil how all these characters meet and i guess one thing i really love in movies which i alluded to earlier is when characters are really good at their jobs and now, I don't like it delivered in a kind of slick George Clooney smugness. I love it delivered in a kind of way that the people that people are after them and they're really smart and capable as well. But because our heroes are so good at what they do that they are able to outsmart them. And for every move the opposition makes, our heroes are so good at what they do that they are forced to adapt and improvise. And it's really high-end intellectual cat and mouse stuff. Now I really loved all these characters and although I guess they are far from fully fleshed out or drift far beyond archetypes or again maybe these characters helped create the blueprint for these type of characters in future heist movies it's hard to say but the defining trait that these characters have again in a non Ocean's Eleven type of way is how professional they are and how clever they are and how good they are at each of their chosen tasks in fact this would be michael mann's version of oceans 11 uh, come to think of it everything is so minimalist and the dialogue is sparse yet i felt a strong affinity towards all these characters and i don't really know why and it's a very rare thing in a way the dynamic between the three characters kind of reminded me of a more harmonious unified version of Clint um, Van Cleef and Eli Wallach in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, except these guys are all working together with, Tor uh, with Corey taking on the ultra cool Clint persona. Vogel seems a lot more quick to murder you if you cross him. And Jansen, at least initially, seems very much the wild card. Now, as impressed as I was by the, shall we say, underplayed, scene conceptions that happen numerous times in the film this all comes together times 10 or times 11 if you want to spinal tap it in the film's final third when the film refocuses and we get its finest set piece the heist itself now in the lead up to and the planning of the heist there are things that the cam camera captured that didn't really make sense to me there was a scene where the camera pans to the names of the building where the heist takes place that I kind of wondered what was going on, only for it to be revealed later on. And even why they needed Jensen in the first place as a shooter, I totally misconstrued. And listen, here's one of the beauties of the heist. Listen, check it out. It's a neat trick. But maybe in any heist movie that I've ever watched, we get a scene where we see the planning of the heist and what they are planning to do and what they're going to do. It's usually slick exposition surrounded by funky music where we feel equally as slick and part of the heist. The pre-heist walkthrough is even spoofs and things like horrible bosses. It's a staple of the genre and at this point and what I absolutely love was that I never even realised at all while watching this movie until maybe halfway through the heist itself that I didn't even think about. We don't even know their plan. The heist itself is a glorious 27 minute scene of no dialogue. We are not even fully aware of the plan. We get glimpses when they stake out the place of what needs to be done to an extent. Where the cameras are and so on. But we don't, we don't really know exactly how they're going to do it. And I presumed they needed a shooter because they were going to rob a place initially. Or if something went wrong to shoot the cops. But you just don't know until it unfolds. It's very refreshing. And if you think about it, what is the pre-heist walkthrough in heist films? Only exposition. It kind of ruins it and it tells us what they have planned to do for an extent. And I guess what they're going to do next to an even bigger extent. Because you're constantly checking to see if their plan is going to plan. And in a good heist movie, all the small moments that we were talked to earlier will need to work in order for everything 
to be successful. So we get these micro panic moments, but ultimately we are just watching what we are told will happen earlier on in the scene happening. And a lot is lost in that um, exposition pre-heist walkthrough. But what I love about this is that not only do we get the tension of the heist itself, but we also get some real genuinely cool surprises in how they pull it off because we were never told to begin with <laughs> how they were going to do it entirely. And because there is no dialogue, because we aren't privy to how they will do it to an extent, we're almost watching it in the way that a security guard would through CCTV, except we get our CCTV delivered through glorious, realized cinematography and carefully choreographed editing to unfold events. It's just a really beautiful movie. And I think if you're a fan of the glory days of 1970s Hollywood, it's that type of vibe. And it also has the same kind of darkness, actually, when the story unfolds further and by the time the film ends. So, yeah, I'm really glad I checked it out. And with nothing new coming up in the near future, treat yourself to a real cinematic experience and watch The Circle Rouge. I would definitely recommend it.